to talk about about going in night and listening for hives. And I have tried, and I think you have to be an Amerindian. With, no, no. If you're an Amerindian, you're born and grow in the jungle, and you're not accustomed to low Western living, then you'll hear hum. They, they talk about in the night when the forest is quiet, they will have bees that will come to the entrance of the hive and hum loudly to ventilate the hive. Right? Since the entrance, you can hear, you can hear a honeybee hive doing that at night, where the hive is open and you have thousands of bees. When it's just one bee in an, that is in an entrance way that is one bee wide, you're not hearing them. I have tried, and, 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 and I am a person always in the bush, but I think if you've grown up in a Western lifestyle with noise, you're deaf to that, that level of noise, so forget that. So unless you come across a nest, you stumble on the nest, you fall over it, head first into it, and pig one run you, you're not going to find a nest. You're not going to find a nest. So it's, it's Forget about locating nests in the wild, right? You know, talk about boxing the nest. Before you can harvest any, you have to box the nest. Before bees, you, you, you're looking to keep is the, the Wanot, the Eric, the Pagon, the Petiaja. Those are the four bees. The bees that you're going to be keeping have two, these are honeypots. This is where you're going to get your honey and your, and your pollen. This is the brood comb. Now, the, the bees that you're going to be keeping have two types of brood comb. They either look like this, stacked pancakes, right? Stacked discs with supporting little pillars in between, or a bunch of grapes. The one that is the pity angel that is a bunch of grapes, you, you can't separate them. You, you can't split them. If you find the nest, you take the whole bunch of grapes, if you locate your queen, because the queen cannot fly, she has a large distended abdomen. Cannot fly. You take her, work her into a little container with a feather and separate her. Take the whole brood out and put it in a box. Right? These, you do the same thing. You take the whole, we're talking about a wild hive. You've found a wild hive, you split the log, you've broken the, open the wall, right? Wherever the hive is located. These, you will take the whole brood out and put it into the brood box. Don't put any of this stuff into the box. You don't put any honey pots or any pollen pots into the box because once you touch these, they will be damaged, they will leak, and they will attract pests that will go in and lay eggs on it and make maggots. And then the maggots will move from the food stores to the brood and destroy the whole nest. So you just move the brood. Okay? The honey has to be separated from the pollen. The pollen will be mixed with honey and put into pots, and the honey will be put into separate pots. The pots look alike. So you have to go through. You have to go through. You take it out from the wild hive and you put it in a basin. You have your brood in the box, separate, clean, no honey with it. Mm -hmm. And you have to go through your pots and find the pollen. You're not, you're, you're harvesting all the honey for yourself. You don't give the bees any, any of the honey back. You're making a simple syrup, 50% sugar, 50% water, and you feed them with simple syrup. Okay? That will be less of an attractor to the pests than the real honey. The, the pollen, they need the pollen. You can't just feed them sugar water. The pollen has to be taken out of the pots individually. Right? You have to get a very small spoon. If you, if you, there are these little, um, air spoons that you can buy. Take wax out of human ears. Right, a silver spoon. You use that and you scoop, scoop it out and you pack it into sweet drink covers, like the cover of a, of a gelato bottle. You pack it into, into that and then in the pharmacies you can buy little blocks of honeybee wax. You melt it and once it is packed tightly into the, into the sweet drink cover, you give it one quick dip in molten honeybee wax. So it's capped, okay? And then you put all those cap bottle caps into your hive, okay? One of them, you score the top. It's a very thin layer of wax, but it's sealed, so it's not giving off scent mm -hmm. to the pest. You score it with a, with a straight pin, 
And once you've scored it with a stripping, the bees will realize that they have wax, they, they, they will fall on the wax and they will open it up. And then when they finish feeding on that, they now realize that the other pots have fallen into they will start to cut the other pots. Right? So that is how you have to put the pollen into the nest once you've boxed it. Because there is a fly that goes in and lays over everything. It's a tiny little fly and it will wipe out your, your hive very quickly. And the larger bees are very susceptible to these flies. The hive is dark, they can't see what's going on inside. The flies are tiny about the size of a, of a, of a sour fly, a, 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 a fruit fly, and they will be all in between the legs of the bees and the bees will go there. there. Now, for the splitting of this, the one that the brood looks like a bunch of grapes. They make very few queen cells. And so the queen cell is about the same size as a regular worker cell in the petiagel. So you cannot, you cannot, and, and to separate a bunch of grapes, you, you're destroying all the, all the brood cells in it. So you're, you're killing a lot, of, a lot of workers. But this, so forget about splitting. Pity Angel hives. There's another way for making new hives in Pity Angel. This will apply to the Wanot, Eric, and the Pagon. Now, each disc on a bee that produces this, this type of brood, each disc will have one or more queen cells per disc. They will always be on the outside edge of the disc, and they will be always larger than the more prevalent worker cell. So all you need to do, right, is once you have an active hive already boxed from your wild hive and it has now regained strength, you split the tower of brood into two. So if you have eight brood, you split four into the new box and then you four in the old box. And you can move the queen, the queen can stay on any side, it doesn't matter because they have, each, each one of these discs will have queen cells, okay? You have to move workers. You have to move workers across. This is where this comes in. This is something called a bee vacuum. Very simple. They have, they have one with real using shock wax and all kind of things. But all, all, all you have to do is, you have to get, split your, your workers in the colony in half. So you have to take half the workers over to the, to the new daughter hive. So, you're gonna hype eventually. Right? <laughs> because you have to be sucking up your workers. One, one side has wire in it, so that once the bees get in here, they cannot come up, they can't breathe in the bees. One side has a little bit of a couple of stein wire stuffed into it. And this will, you'll have to use this for Pagon, for Eric, and for Wanot. No. Some one not hive, when you tap on the box, they will come out. Other one not hive, when you tap on the box, they all go in. The, the one that is at the guard, the door, he goes in and they, they all get quiet. So you have to know your hive. If you have one not that come out, they will just come out and, and fly around. I have seen one not attack people once, but only once. So you have to know your bees. Generally speaking, you have to use your bee vacuum to harvest up workers to put into your new hive. Petit Angel, you just put a bottle like this over the, the hive and knock the box. And they will, they will come out, they will readily come out and, and fill and give you workers. When you are doing this, you have to do this. When you sit in the hive, you have to do it in the evening time. Because the workers that are collected cannot be put into the new hive before dark. You go to the hive after dark, remove the cover, and tap the bottom of the bottle, and just all the workers will just fall and they close it back. If you, if you split the hive in the morning and you have the worker bees in here whole day without food, they're all buzzing around, hyper and energetic, you're trying to get back to the hive, they're going to burn out their food stores and they're going to die of exhaustion. They're going to come in and find a whole bottle of bees. So this has to be done from about 3, 4 o'clock. Okay? This is a bunch of grapes. Right? This, will, this is what the petit angel type of bee will produce. You cannot divide that. You cannot divide this. This, every three months, 
bees that produce brood like this can be divided. Every three months, a hive, if the hive is being fed on syrup, every three months, the hive can be split. Once the weather is dry, you never go into a hive in rainy weather with these bees because then the forest flies, their population is up. Never store manure anywhere close to a bee because the forest flies breed in manure. So you're going to have a, a higher population of forest flies in the environment. Only go into the hives when you have nice sunny weather and these can be split every three months once they've been fed. These cannot be split at all. The tetia gel cannot be split at all because, as you can see, separating this, to separate this hive, this, this brood here, all you need is an icing knife. The knives you use to have ice cakes, you get one and you bend it like an L and you stick it between the layers and you, you, you fry it apart and you can take the whole top half of the brood off. And what you do is you take bits of wax, when you put it in a new box, you take bits of wax and you roll it into little balls the size of maybe a pigeon pea. And you rest four of them, and you rest the brood on top of that. So the bees can get underneath to, to clean out any damage, any cells that you have damaged in handling. Mm -hmm. They can pull out everything from inside that cell and dispose of it. Right? You rest it, so it's not resting flat on the bottom of the box. Okay? This, you would completely destroy that if you try to split that into you. Have to, you'd have to take a knife or something and cut it down. That would just be a mess and they don't make a lot of queen cells. So, the split hives, what I have done, is I have come upon my own technique, is I have made a lure from wild hives that I have boxed. Once you, once you box a, you find a hive living in a, in a red brick wall, you break open the wall, you take out all the honey and everything, and you box the brood. And then once you have removed the honey, from the pot, you take all the remnants and you put it and all the, all, all the extraneous wax and resonance that is found inside the hive. You take it and you put it in isopropyl alcohol, right? And you just make a loop. Dissolves into the isopropyl alcohol and you make empty boxes, coat the inside of that mixture and it has the smell of the bees. And the more hives you have, the more of a chance you will have of that hive splitting off in the dry season and going into one of your little boxes. So you get one hive in a wall, you put that hive in your garage. And you put two empty boxes that have been baited with the loop next step. And in the dry season, you will see a big cloud of bees. Usually they will split once for the dry season and make one daughter hive if it's the angel. The chances of them going into the two empty boxes that are impregnated with, with the correct scent is greater than them going and looking to make a nest in a bamboo patch somewhere, right? So the more bees you have in your garage, is the more of a chance you're going to get captured hives, right? But that is the only way to split this. But you have to you have to get a hive to get the scent to make a loop, and then you start you start rolling. These can be split every three months, okay? You get, you, get, um, you get these in the, in the pharmacy with sulfur powder and different things in it. If you go to VNS Pharmaceuticals in Carony, you can buy these by the bag. Okay? You bore five holes in the top, small enough that the bee cannot get in. Right? Um, these holes have actually been closed up with resin because I had put these in a box with Pedia. And the Pedia went in and filled it up from resin. The, the, they have resin on the inside, mm -hmm. right? But um, even if you put it in with one, you don't want the hole big enough that the bee can get it. You just want it big enough that a sour fly, a, a fruit fly, you get a wrong rotten pig, can get it, right? Although it's, it's not that fly itself, it's a forehead that, that we put in bait for. The bees will still block it up with resin on the outside. They don't want this inside the hive, they don't want the smell. You, you put apple cider vinegar in this. The sour smell of the apple cider vinegar attracts the forest fly. And the forest fly, when they get in the hive, they will go in here. Not all of them will go in here, but you're gonna catch a large majority of them. They will go in here instead of going to damage honey, honey pots. Or oh, damage, because you're gonna damage brood. Moving the brood across to the new box, you're going to damage it. And that in itself is going to attract the forest fly. So you're gonna get forest flies coming in. The forest flies will go in here and drown in the apple cider vinegar. 
So every two or three days you have to reopen your box and make sure the holes are clear. And only use brags or Heinz. Heinz? Heinz. 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 Real apple cider vinegar. Don't yeah. use don't use apple cider <coughs> flavored vinegars. Don't use white vinegar. Um the literature they have literature that will tell you any vinegar. No, 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 no. Apple cider vinegar. I've I've tried all different kind of I've tried wine gone sour and no no only apple cider. Apple cider vinegar has the best results. Right? They are attracted to the apple cider vinegar because the honey and the pollen of the stingless bee is highly acidic. So they are they are You're not seeing the, they, they are mistaking the apple cider vinegar for damaged brood, damaged um, honey pots or pollen pots. That is the, the mistaken it. And you see the apple cider vinegar has a stronger smell than honey. So once you get into the hive, they're smelling, they're smelling the damaged um, what they're going to be attracted into the hive for, even though you're not putting any pollen and the honey pots. You're feeding them simple syrup and you're, you are, you are putting the pollen into the sweet drink bottle caps and dipping it to make sure there is no damaged stuff around the hive. Damaged food can stores. You are damaging the brood. You are going to damage the brood. Just by holding it, it's very thin wax on the outside of the cells, they're going to damage it. And the stingless beads are total provisional in that when a honeybee has the brood cell, they lay the egg in the cell and the cell remains open and the workers keep coming and feeding the larva until it reaches the stage where it wants to pupate and then the cell is capped. In the stingless beads, they are total provisional. In other words, the queen does not go and lay an egg in an empty cell and then the workers feed it. The workers fill the cell with all the food that is needed for the entire life of the larva. And then the queen passes it around and when she sees cells that have been filled with stores, then she lays her egg on it. And immediately after laying the egg, they have workers that follow the queen that catch the cell. So any damaged cell, you're going to have the smell of pollen and honey permeating the hive. And that is going to pull in the forest flies, which are going to turn the whole hive into mush. So you have, depending on the bee, you have to be diligent because certain bees will clean, clean a newly boxed hive very diligently. Other bees, if you don't clean it, that's it, they're dead. Okay? And this is simple to make, the vacuum. This is your in-hive forest fly trap. And this is your outside the hive forest fly trap. It's a jam bottle with your mask, with your duct tape. What happens, you put your vinegar in here, Fly goes in, is attracted back upwards to the light coming through the clear cap. Right? More light is coming in through the top and three sides, and they come up now around here. I use um, baby bell cheese. Baby bell cheese has a red wax around it that does not dry, it does not get hard. No matter how many times you use it and you, you take it off, the change of vinegar, you can take off the baby bell wax, work it like plasticine, and put it back. I suppose you could get the same. I don't even know if they still sell baby bell cheese. I have a big ball on that wax. I suppose you could get the same effect if you take beeswax and melt it with increasing increments of Vaseline until you get that wax. But you want this to be sealed down, properly sealed down with the wax, and then the, the forest fire will go in. You need to have bees at all times around your house, especially in the rainy season. need when you're dealing with singing seeds. Very simple, right? Um, you're gonna want you're gonna want some putty knives, right? This is really only needed for the paper. That is this is really only needed for the paper and, and the net because they don't sting but pagon you'll get in a strong pagon hive you'll get about 30,000 workers and they will come out and they will bite all your eyes, your nose, everywhere. Um, now, the smoker in a honeybee, what happens is in a honeybee, the honeybee queens can fly, they can abscond. So when they smell smoke, they, they think a fire is coming to destroy the hive. So 
all the workers will drink as much honey as possible in preparation for leaving the area with the queen to go and escape the fire and form a new hive. And once they drink all that honey and the honey stomach is full, then they get lethargic and they don't want to, they don't want to sting as much as a right? But stingless bees, the queens cannot win. The queens cannot win. So the smoke has to be, and especially using the smoke on the pea one, which is a very aggressive bee. They cannot fill their honey stomachs because they know the queen cannot fly, so they're not going to they're not going to do that. They're just gonna come out and attack you. The smoke has to be something that will drug the bees. Okay, so not just regular smoke. The honey bee men just use cardboard and, and cellotex all kinds of things they use. This has to be a smoke that will drug the bees. What I have found works very well on the pagon is clove. Clove leaves. If you have a clove tree, mm. the leaves smell just like clove, and clove um, is an anesthetic in itself. So the clove anesthetizes the bees and they get, yeah, they get, okay? Um, for, you want a, a big basin, you want a sip. A feather will work, a, a feather will work better to get your queen into, into a little container like this if it's a petit angel, because the queens are going to be really tiny. You can use a brush, you can use a brush for the armor, for the one of any people, a small paintbrush. Okay? Okay. Go back, go back to the armor. A picture the height. So, okay, see how you put on the good honeypot. Well, let's see what the cold pot is for. Is that a cold pot answer? Yeah, the cold pot, you can use that on that pig on high. You want the smoker, but you want the cold, you want the cold pot too before you breach a pig on high. You put your, you put your, uh, uh, like that. what I found that works well too with the pig on is um, termite nest. Termite nest, I believe it has, um, the termite produce um, camphor or, 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 or naphthalene. It's something that the termites produce that it's very good for um, mosquitoes. And it, it works, it works on, on the bees. So if you have a, a big piece of dry termite nest and you put that in the cold pot and you push it down a stick on the peg on and step back, they will calm down. And as they start to break open the hive again, they're gonna have the workers inside that did not get that. And you don't want to be in the full heavy swoop. So you use your clove inside this inside the um, smoker, the honey bee smoker. Once you open the hive. You want to have somebody stand up next to you, puffing that smoke all the time. So this is this is for people. These three things are for people. The other bees, they don't really need much, much um, in protection. They they're not gonna really attack you. Okay. All right. They do not put their honey. They do not put their honey in in combs like honey. And bees, you can get them to build their comb in a frame. You can put the frame in a centrifuge and spin out the honey. Take a cap and cap and knife and remove the cap. Spin out, spin out the honey in a centrifuge. All, all the variations. You know, cut out, cut out the honeycomb. Put it in a honey press. That back in the days when they were using the, the, the wax to make candles. So you get your wax, so you get your honey. These bees put the honey in pots. Okay. You're gonna have let us let us say let us say you have you have the um, the one knot. Now the one knot which is it is is the one that makes the pancake ice. When they when they come in here, the entrance, they will make a wax tube on the inside of the hive that will come from, from the inner opening, come down to the floor and they can help. Okay? Then they will make their brood as close to the entrance as possible. You're going to have all your honey pots and and um, pollen pots to the back. Away, it is it is very popular in South America to use a small vacuum to break open the top of the pot and suck out the honey. Break open the top of the pot and suck out the honey. I don't like that. I don't like that. I scoop out everything. Scoop out everything because when you break you when you look at a sealed pot, you cannot tell the honey the, the, the wax is brown. So you cannot tell if it is pollen in the pot or honey in a closed pot. When you break open a pot and you see no that pollen, no, I want that. Pollen, I want that. Oh honey, I want that. And you, and you suck out the honey. You now have two open pollen pots. That letting out a lot of fumes that attract any foreign flies. Yeah. 
You scoop everything out. Put it in a big sieve. Right? Honey and pollen don't mix. Honey bee men will know that. Honey, the, 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 the pollen will flow. Mm -hmm. So you, 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 you roughly break up everything and your pollen will, your honey will drain out through the sieve, your pollen will stay behind and you can harvest your pollen separately. You can now go back and pick through the pots and pick out the pollen. Right? The honey goes through the sieve and it is, it is, um, it is bottled. Also, the vacuuming of the honey aerates the honey and can cause spoilage in the honey. Right? It can cause spoilage in the honey. Right? Depending on how clean your stuff is. And, it, 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 and not only spoilage in the honey, this honey, honey, uh, uh, stingless bee honey is a lot higher in water than honey bee honey. And what is the preservative in it? What is the preservative in it? Is the high one of one of the preservatives is the high acid content, okay? And the high acid content is because it ha each bee has their own particular strain of yeast and either lactic acid bacteria or acetyl acid bacteria. That after the yeast ferments some of the sugars into alcohol, it turns it into acetic acid. Now, when you drain out the honey. You are not aerating honey. And anybody who's making wine knows when air hits the alcohol, the alcohol turns into vinegar. So when you aerate the honey with, a, with a, a, a suction pump and it comes out frothy on the other end, you're really putting a lot of oxygen into your honey. So you, the honey now, you're going to lose a lot more of your sugar into vinegar. So you're going to end up, it, it's not going to spoil in the sense that it's bad, you're going to end up with honey vinegar. You're not going to end up with, with, with honey. So the shelf life of your honey is going to crash. You're going to end up with honey vinegar here. Right? Something to make, it makes a, it really, makes a really nice pepper sauce. <laughs> it makes a really nice pepper sauce. But it's not, going to, it's not going to stay honey for long. If you use it through a sieve and you stabilize it, it's going to stay there permanently. It's not going to go bad. Okay? When you scrape out all your pots, when you scrape out all your pots, you will, you will notice that the bees build pots on top of pots. So if you're just breaking a couple to the top, you're not getting inside there and you're going to have a build up of waste stuff. You might get, you might get some sort of mites or something in your hive. You're going to want to clean out your hives on a regular basis. Just like when you go into a honey beehive, you can take out the combs and see what's going on and, and, and remove the super boxes and clean them out and put them back. With these hives, you don't want them to get too dirty inside. So it's a good thing to scrape out all, all, the, um, all the honey pots and pollen pots and start anew. What I like, I'm going to do the hive design in a, a small way. What I think is the best hive design for I, I keep my pity agile on a hive like this. Pity agile are the ones that produce the brood that looks like a bunch of grapes. They don't make much honey. They make about 90 mils per hive per year, $50 a teaspoon. But what they do, they are different to the, to the others. They make their bunch of grapes as far away from the entrance as possible. Okay? So, I used to keep in boxes like this. I am now going to a box that is four inches wide in the interior and long. So when they go in at the end, they make they just it, it, so it, it, it's mimicking a row of red bricks in a wall. Mm -hmm. If you see the entrance of a petit angel high here in a red brick wall, it's right to the other end of that horizontal row of blocks. They go right as far as they can go. <coughs> When you put it in a long box and the, the brew is as far away from the entrance as possible, you just scrape out everything, hold the box at an angle, and let the honey drain out, and then cap it back. And they, 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 they reboot everything. This is, this is a, a bee, this is a Melapona Bichia, <coughs> or, or Zoom in Cap. This is the royal bee of the Mayans. How the Mayans kept them was in the logs that they were found in. And what they would do is they would cut the log, you see the entrance here, on the side of the log. And they would keep cutting the log up until they broke into the cavity that the bees were in. And what they would do is the brood would be in the center, right here behind the entrance. And then on either side, they would have the honey pots. 
they would block up the two holes with a clay disc or a stone disc with mud. Okay? And every year they would come and this year they would open the side and scrape out all the honey and pollen from the brood back to the center and then block it up. And then next year they would go on the other side. So there would always be a store of honey and nectar left for the bees. With the melacona, I have this come up with the idea that I believe simplicity is best. They have all kind of fancy high designs that are real complicated and they with all kind of pieces fitting together and that's places for ants and flies to get in and so I think the best it's a log design, but made in a box. So, instead of the entrance being here, the entrance is here. Okay? The interior of the box has a wall, two walls. So that the brood is right on the other side of the entrance. Two walls on the interior that come right up flush to the top, like the two end walls here. And you can put plastic. I use the, um, the transparent plastic that you cover school books with. You get two kinds, a sticky one and a non-sticky one, you use the non-sticky one. And your brood is in the center here. On, you have holes on, in the interior wall, so they can go from the brood chamber to the honey chamber. Mm -hmm. And every year you open it up and you scrape out everything on this side this year, next year you scrape out everything on this side. And there are no pieces that fit together, there's nothing like that, it is just, it is just and if you'll notice, there's a thing where in these you're screwing down the, the, the covers so that they fit tight and you don't get any flies going in. No, 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 no. I use baby bell cheese, smear it along here, and then you put down your plastic. And your plastic sticks in baby bell cheese, the flies cannot get in, and you just rest the cover on top to keep out the light. Because if light gets in, you can, you can rest a piece of black bristol board now on top of the plastic and then this board on top because any light that gets in the bees will put a layer of resin to block all the light the bees don't want light so you will come back and if, if light is getting in if it's, if, the, if it's a skew like that and light is getting you will come back and find that the bees have put a big layer of resin and that is going to be a problem when you open up the hives to see about seven because the, the resin will eventually harden right so right so it's very simple very simple right a basic box design Right, but you, and that way you're, you're, you're only ever taking half of the stores of your bee. But every year you are cleaning out one side. So any kind of pests that are getting in there, you're gonna get a build up of, um, of poop because they have, they have little latrine dumps they have inside their hive. Right, you're gonna get a build up of, of excrement, you're not gonna get a build up of, of possible mites or any kind of pathogens inside of there. Every year you clean it out, and once you take out everything on that side, you wipe it out. Wipe it out good. With just, just a damp cloth. Right? Wipe it out because if there is spilled panning inside of there or or spilled um, pollen from taking out the pot, it will attract the forage flies to go in. Okay, so you wipe it out with, with, a, with a damp cloth and seal it back and good to go. But the honey, once the honey is passed through a sieve and you, you, you take not only little bits of, of, of the honey pots and stuff, little bits of wax and stuff, the honey just has to be put into a jar and it, it's, it's self-preserving. The, the real work is with the pollen. You have to go through the pots and pick out the pollen, scoop out the pollen. And there, there is sale for the pollen. Depending on the type of bee and what it's feeding on, the pollen can be actually very acidic or very sweet. You have to, be, you have to go to the pest because when you open up the hive, you have to be aware that you're going to get the pest. The main pest is the forest bite. The forest bite. Then you have to look out for ants. Certain ones of the bees are much more susceptible to ants than other bees. Right? If the, ant, the ants are going to want to go in and feed on the lava, feed on the honey. Right? Then those are the two you have to be wary of when you're opening up the hive. This is a forest bite here. Um, basically, um, as an amateur, I can tell the forest fly, and that, that, they're going to be way too small for you to see them this clearly. Um, they run. They run. They're not like, they're about the same size, and some of them are close to the same color as the sour flies you get around rock the fruit, fruit flies, Drosophilia. But these are a completely different genus, and they run. 
sour fly, they pass your hand by, by, by rotten fruit and they just all raise up these run. And they run in a very erratic zigzag. They have, I'm not sure, as far as I can see, there are they're three forest flies. They're, they're well more than that, but there are three forest flies that affect the bees. Only females will be found inside the hive. There is a big and a small that is found inside the hive. Right? That goes into the maggots, the eggs, and produce maggots on the brood and stuff. And there is a third one that has a very large ovipositor. And she holds it between her legs. And when the larger bees, she looks like a fur I'm not sure if, it, if it's a florist like genus. When the larger bees, the, the Wanot and the Eric, are landing, if there, if, if, if there is high activity in the hive, so that there are bees on the outside waiting to go in and out, you'll see her on the outside of the hive and she will run up to the bee and lay an egg inside the bee. She actually jabs the bee with her ovipositor and lays an egg inside the bee. I'm not sure if it's a forest fly, it looks like a forest fly, but that is a pest on the outside of the hive. And what I have found is that Forage can be kept away from the outside of the hive by putting crackle seed oil around the outside of the entrance. Right, the seed we have here in Trinidad, in the hive, people, they, they make the oil for arthritis and cold, it's, it's, it's a little medicine, but I, um, I got that from fellas in South America using it around the, they put, you see the crackle seed oil all day. You smell the crackle seed oil. It'll, that's a deterrent to the forest flies, and it's also a deterrent to this one that lays eggs in the bee, live bee itself. Compared to honeybees, because of the amount of resin that is in their nests, they, their nests are loaded with resin, and resin is antibacterial, antifungal, right? And then some, some of the bees actually produce um, salivary compounds that are, right? The trapping of the swarms, you have to have lure. You build your boxes, right? And you bait your box with um, the stuff found inside a hive. I have no, I have, I've been doing this so long that I have one box of lure I use. Every hive I find, once I box it and take out the onion, all the guts and everything is thrown into it all the wax and mm. so it has the smell of walnut, it has the smell of pig on it has the smell of all, all the bees in it. So it's a, a multi-species look. In South America, they bait all kind of things. They, they bait um, plastic bottles, the, the big plastic five gallon, um, five liter plastic bottles. Mm. They get this soap in, they bait that and they get hives going into the, the, the tetra packs, the cardboard packs, they get um, milk and juicing in. Um, I have never gotten the um, bamboo pods. Um, Professor Starr was asking me about that when he was here. And I have never gotten anybody to go into a bamboo pod. And he says he neither is either, but in, in, in um, Asia, yeah, really in India, they, they, they keep them in bamboo pods. They, 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 they get them going into bamboo pods and colonizing on their own. The only thing I have ever gotten bees to go into is a wooden box. Right? That is the only thing. But with the wooden boxes, when you bait your wooden box, you have to go every day and take a stick and poke in the hole. Because what happens is you have a bee down here called euglossine bees. They are either metallic blue or metallic green. They are orchid bees. Mm. And they're, they're semi-solitary. They're, they're not quite solitary, but they don't have... Several females will lay the eggs in the box, but each female is on her own. They're, 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 they're not structured like a, mm -hmm. like, a, like a honeybee or a singlet bee nest. And what they will do is, uh, they say you have three or four females that come in here, they lay the eggs and they make their little wax pots, resin, resin, use resin. They make their little resin pots and lay the eggs and then they will seal up the hole. So you think you have a box there and you're, you're passing and you're waiting and expecting to catch a colony of bees and that, that has been sealed up. So you have to come every day and, and, and poke it up. Right? Generally speaking, the, the um, concrete between the blocks will have a little gap somewhere and they will go in there. 
okay? So they love, they love the red, red block walls. Once the building has not been completely plastered, you'll get that, right? Um, the one up, they are all hollow trees, the one up in the Eric. Mm -hmm. The Laurier Matak is a tree that naturally becomes hollow and it, 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 um, it gives itself away because it starts sending up suckers from down low. It realizes it is going to be, it's becoming hollow and will get blown over in high winds and it starts sending up suckers. And those trees usually, if you find a big Laurier Matak and you have enough patience and it's just stand up on your looking back, you, know, okay, you will see bee coming one at a time, coming and leave it. Flying it. Mm -hmm. they, they don't, listen, they do not, they do not loiter outside of the nest. It's just zip in, zip out. Mm -hmm. You're not going to see a big set of bees on the outside, right? Only, only if they're swarming, right? But if you see a lorium attack, and it's a big lorium attack, 10 to 1 you'll, you'll find it. A high book. And up there in Brussels, they are full of they full of one out on Eric. Your honey, your wax, after you get all the honey out of the pot, you can melt the wax, and which is not pure wax, it's wax and resin, and you can mix it with fat. The best fat I have found hog fat. You go and you get the hog fat and you render it and you mix it with that with the serum from the bees which is a mixture of, of wax and resin and it makes very good dubbing. Very very good dubbing. Okay? You want a, a 50 50 um, brown sugar. I, um, I know some guys keeping sing, um, honeybees and they say that the brown sugar causes diarrhea in honeybees. Yeah, he's right. Well, that don't make yeah. any difference to the singlet bees. The singlet bees eating the brown sugar, no, no problem. Right? So, 50 50 brown sugar and water. Um, you can add to that, you can add singing nettle. Our singing nettle, yeah. there was work. Uh, I, I have a paper. Which one are you singing nettle? The deep one? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the zuti. Red, red or green stem, it don't matter. The zuti. <laughs> Yeah, mm -hmm. that, that they use to make baji. Mm -hmm. Right, that one. Bloody manzuki, which is a tree. Mm -hmm. yeah, no, not that. Um, work, now, our singing nettles are not real singing nettles. Because our singing nettles are wood nettles. They are annuals. True old world singing nettle is a perennial. It grows, grows back from a rhizoma. It spreads under the ground. Mm -hmm. Work would now, I just figure they're closely enough related. It should work. It's not poisonous. I eat it all the time. Work was done by a university. I have, I have the, the, the scientific paper on, on my computer. By a university in um, Romania that through um, folklore, different beekeepers for years have said there is benefits of putting different herbs into the simple syrup, like peppermint. And, and they, they tried with all different herbs to increase the numbers in here, like a tonic, that add, added nutrients to the simple yeah. syrup. And they found the only one that really had a marked increase was the sting nettle, the European sting nettle. So it is, it is more, it's not really a medicine. We have nine bees recognized in Trinidad. We actually have more, but nine are recognized as being here. But they're not all viable for commercial use. If the viable ones for commercial use are basically your two melopona, which is your why not and your eric, the petit angel, and the pagon. And there is one called irai, nanotribona, testosyconus, which is viable if you can get hives and you can split them. They make, they make stacked hives. You can split them because there is a market for that in Northern Europe for pollination inside it to play close greenhouses. So like up in Iceland and Greenland and stuff, mm -hmm. right? They use those, right? But besides that, they don't serve, they're not gonna produce anything that out of commercial value. And then we have a whole lot of other bees. We have, we have PBRs and we have this, the part of Mona Negrio, which is prized, but is almost impossible to keep. Right, they have some people in South America that can keep them, and other people can't keep them, and nobody knows why. Some people are keeping it, and some people are not. Okay. 
That's just how it is. I want to believe you personally talk about this guy from South America. I had the opportunity of visiting him and in his yard he probably had a bee house that is about the size of that shed and there he had over 100 stingless bees colonies in boxes. But that is Brazil. So maybe their environment could sustain that amount. Um, I would, I would say, say stingless bees don't travel that far. Once you have, look, like, all right, this is the JKST. This is the JKST. When you have a pity eye that will travel at a maximum of 1,000 feet, right? You, have, you just have to make sure that what you have planted is what that particular species likes. Right. Okay, because all right, the pithy angel are the, are the primary pollinator of, of <coughs> Zabaka. They love Zabaka. Right? If you plant a Zabaka estate and you have pithy angel, they're going to other things besides Zabaka, but you have more pithy angel you will have. Because they're not traveling far. Right? And then again, what I have found is invariably, wherever I get one of honey, it's always the same. Where, and where as, as honeybees, the honey berries what they're feeding on. Mm -hmm. So it seems that the singlet bees in Trinidad, in the New World, and I suppose the singlet bees in Africa and the singlet bees in Asia, they have evolved there and they have specialized within that environment on certain plants. So really and truly, the pretty angel is not going to really compete with the one else. They have been here for millions of years. And they have decided, well, hell, I got feed on this flower, I got feed on that flower. The honeybee reach here now, he just scrambled to get whatever he could get. Because he's a generalist. Because where the honeybee comes from in Europe and Africa is mainly honeybee and bumblebee. Mm -hmm. And they have different length tongues, so they, they got to do their own specification too. But the honeybee is, is a generalist. Whereas, because he up there in Europe all by himself to pollinate everything. Okay? Whereas if down here, we have so many single species, and in South America, it's even worse. Right? So they've specialized. The only stingless bee I have come across that has made two kinds of honey is the pagan. The pagan I have come across that has made, they have made in the, in the high wood down in, I think, I don't know, I think one shows up north coast, something up north coast, in a place called Lagoon, in, in um, that real deep inside the forest up in, um, it's like a crater where there is. I, I, I think it might be an old, um, an old volcano or something because there is no way out. There's, there are mountains right around and everything goes down to be sent into this little wrong lake in, in the forest. Yeah. Um, that's up in um, yeah. Las Cuevas area. Yeah. That, that right inside, where they go up in corn, go right up inside. The fellas up in there will know it. You can't get to the edge of the water because it's like peat. Mm. So, it, it really actually that's only a place of one century because if you run dog, the lap will just run and go into the water and swim and the dog, you can't get out there because it's sinking down in peat. Long before you get to where it's water, mm. it's like a bog. I think it was up there. And a shorty the other place was in Guayaguayal. I came across, why I was the first place I came across it? A Pagon hive. On the ground. And I know Pagon. I grew up with a Pagon that's in my yard in Woodbrook. Yeah. I like the fire. Dogs running. I say, well, I done with them fellas. Let them run their, their dog. I, my dog in the park too, but I build my fire and I start to smoke them. I get good ants in there. I start to smoke. Break open the hive. And I came across a sky blue honey. Right? Sky blue. Mm. I took the honey. I think I'm not taking out that. Then I woke up the next morning. <laughs> yeah, I woke up the next morning. You can see, woke up the next morning with a terrible headache. They hear my partner's calling me. And I disappear. They, they don't know where I go. They say, well, chop gun, kill me, or um, um, anaconda, because down there, that, this was going on in a place. It was, in a place, there's a place they have some black anacondas. Right? Um, I pass out, sleep out the whole night, the most vivid dreams. And then the second time I came across it, 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 it seems that they were, they were, and it's not common. Yeah. It's not common. So it's a, it seems to be a monofloral honey. The vine or whatever making the flowers is not very common because they don't see that honey in the pagans all the time. And it maybe doesn't bear every year or whatever. But when I came across a pagan nest again in, in I 
show. But when I came up, I uh, uh, easy pay go and I said, you know, I broke it open. Right? I don't know I got on the ground. Broke it open and I found Skype on you again. Mm. And I spent another night like those people. And I would have wanted to do that. Yeah, folks. Yeah. Interesting discussion. We could be here all morning, I'm sure. When you go and harvest the hide, the hide's normally on the outside of something. Like the, the one that I boxed over there was on the outside of a miniature date farm. Mm -hmm. So is it that they don't like being enclosed? But is there a way of me boxing them and then opening the box so that they're no longer enclosed? And that was I tell you last time about my ideal coconut shells? Yeah. It was yours, right? No, I don't think Okay, so. well, hell. Go, go, go to a picture, go to a picture with like, yeah. um, but yeah, it, is there box. anything I can do with box. once I box no. them in a box like that? Okay, now here what that each bee has a different kind of nest. They have certain bees that are ground nesters, stingless bees that are ground nesters. So because certain bees nest in wood, certain bees nest in ground, bees nest in dirt nests exposed, they're going to want different levels of humidity. Okay? I've tried nest, nesting them in clay pots, it don't work. I tried nesting them in clay pots buried in the ground. I do. I've tried nesting them in wooden boxes. It does not work. And in South America, when you see people on the internet keeping them, it's in wooden boxes. Hmm. Not, not Partamona Negrio, but Partamonas, which is very similar to this, right? The, um, the, 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 the entrance is slightly different, but okay. Um, I have these. Well, once, once I have them in a box, I like. Is there any way of me opening the box so that they could now maybe cover the? Well, box my the box? my idea, my idea. There is a bee in the Philippines. I do have a, I do have a. Okay, see, I was I tried this because this is a this is of a of a hive of a bee called Scapto trigona mexicana. The Nahuatl Indians in in Mexico keep these. And I was figuring, well, okay, I put it in clay pots and I put it pot in the ground. It didn't work. I put it up, box another hive and I. Uh, Put it outside where it get rain because I would figure the terracotta would allow allow it to breathe and moisture in the past. It did not work. Now, there, these bees are one of the most common of all single bees because a lot of the time they make they don't need a cavity to make their nest. All of our single bees are cavity nesters. Mm. Okay, these bees are cavity nesters and they're not cavity nesters in the sense that. Um, all, all the other bees, the nest is completely enclosed in a cavity, whether it's inside a wall, inside a tree. If the tree has a large hole, they will block up the entire hole with something called bacumen, which is a mixture of clay, resin, dirt, and plant fibers, I guess, like cement. I'll just leave a passage, one, one bee wide. Okay. These bees make a nest, like a wood ant's nest, a dirt nest. You know, you know, more of the material, you know, the ant, they call halliquel, that makes the long nest hanging from the citrus trees. They make, mm -hmm. right, it, it, it's, it's like this. This is almost, almost like a long <laughs> No, so you might make it the wrong nest, but they have, they have a halliquel nest hanging right there. Yeah, is it flatish? Yeah. Like, like a, like yeah. a salactite yeah. hanging up, okay. This yeah. and the pagan don't need an, a cavity to whole entire nest. When they're starting a new, cow, a new colony, all they need is somewhere to sequester the queen before she becomes gravid and her abdomen swells and she can't fly anymore. So she will, she will leave the mother hive and go to a new location. And what a, new, a location that these bees really like are wild pines. The queen will go into the roots of the wild pine and they will, they will wall her up inside the roots with dirt and whatever that is made from. And then they will start to extend the hive outwards. And you'll get this big thing like a wood on side. But once they have started to build that hive, they will break the wall of the queen's chamber and she will come out into a larger chamber. They just sequester in that first little chamber to protect her. But they're going to make much larger hives. So I was thinking, I haven't tried it yet, but there is a bee in the Philippines that makes a nest like that. And what they do is they take they make a big tree, like out of square birdcage wire, 
right? right? With four four wires coming up, so it's like a hanging basket with a, a big a big square or rectangular tree with a, a shallow wall of the same wire going around square hardware cloth, right? Yeah. And then they put they put the hive that they get in a, in a wild vine, you know, in, a, in mm -hmm. the roots of a vine, and they put that on the tree just like that. They break it out from the tree. They don't they don't box it in and it just rests there on the on the wire. And then they take empty coconut shells and rest around it. And the bees extend from their hive into the empty coconut shells. And all around the edge of the empty coconut shell that is exposed to air, air can get in. They yeah. seal up with this kind of mixture. Right? And when you come to harvest now, you just take off the shells on top and you'll find inside of the shells have now been covered with honey pots. And you just scrape out the honey and you put it back. Yeah, yeah. And they seal it back. So I, I have wanted to try doing that, but I haven't gotten around to it. But right. there would be no way to like open a box like that. Like what Earl was... No, no you were saying like to just sort of I bust have, the side have, or something. I have a wife that I bought two months ago because it was growing on the cabin there. Well, that, 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 that's still young. It's still young, but I'm wondering if I can just open the top or will that now let the forage flies that in? Will, or will, or will they seal it? Yeah, or can I put a piece of glass or plastic on top so that they use the light you know and they start you know sealing things off and then I take off the what plastic? What you could try, what you could try is getting a piece of cotton cloth Real tight weave cotton mm -hmm. and put, put the whole thing okay, a cotton on top. And then let them seal So let them read there and they will yeah. seal up what they want and then it they will make the open a certain amount to let the correct amount of moisture. moisture. Right. Okay. You could try that. Because what happens with these is once you box them, as you can see, yeah. this box yeah. is full. <laughs> right? They completely fill up the box and then after about a year you start to see the traffic start to lessen, 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 lessen. I have, I have boxed over and over, and what eventually happens is the queen comes out. You eventually see the queen, she comes out and she starts to walk around by a little lonesome, and when you open the box, there's nobody there. And the queen is the last man standing. Yeah. Right? So it's not that something has killed the queen, and there's no one there to re queen, and I, 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 I do, and this is the exact same thing that the, 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 the witnesses have heard. So, at the, uh, we don't know. But the honey, the honey is very good. What type of wood do you use to make the um You could use any kind of wood. Just make sure it is not it is not pine from inside the hardware that has been sprayed. Okay. I have made that mistake already. Mm. Go to go to uh, but I would I would recommend either cedar or tea because okay. it's to make resistance. Oh. Right? It's to make resistance. The cedar tea. And David, is the box kept indoors or outdoors or kept Well, you can keep it outdoors. We have to put a piece of, have to put a piece of galvanized on top of it. Uh -huh. South America, they, they make little individual stands and have them all above. And they put a little piece of galvanized on two rocks and keep your rain off from this one. You have to keep them indoors and try that because invariably, people in your neighborhood are going to find out if it's not this year, it's going to be next year, the year after, they, and they're going to steal it. The pipers are going to come and they're going to steal your honeybee hives. The same with bees. They are very susceptible to being stolen. They have bees in South America that are kept alongside. There is a, there is a, a thing, this bee called Kakafogo, ships fire. So they keep alongside these hives. Other species, because their thing is the, is the watchdog hive. Yeah. They, they bite you and they spit. Um, I think it's very, I'm not sure if it's formic acid or acetic acid, but very strong acid into the wound. So you, it's like bad singing it all over. And they have large colonies, like 25 to 50,000. So when they're taking your skin, they're not singing you, but they're singing. Yeah. Right? Okay, take a break. You had a question? Yeah, I don't know, if maybe you already covered this. Is there like a good community on the island that you're part of? Or, you know, like Trini Bats. Is okay, where there is, I started, listen, I used to be on Facebook, <laughs> right, and there is a group on Facebook, um, Lena right now is the, is the administrator of oh. it. We had a discussion yeah. with interested persons, get a sense of what should be the next step. Yeah. What, what, what should a network look like? Should it be an organization? Should it be a lobby group? Should it just be driven by yeah. a database? Whatever. Whatever so yeah. we've had that discussion and I think we'll decide what Well, what, what you can do, do I don't know that. Have you found any other groups in South America? Or, I mean, it sounds like you've been Oh, yeah, um, like um, Singers Beekeeping is big. Trinidad, not late to the party. 
doing a party going on somewhere. <laughs> right? I had people come down from from Japan and sort me out that they were seeking stainless bee honey. Because in Japan, they have this company, there's a documentary myself that was playing on Japanese TV. Went up into, into Lufino and we, we boxed a high for them to see and okay. They go all around the world and buy stainless bee honey from South America, Africa, um, Philippines, Australia, and each species honey is different. And the Japanese are into the stainless bee honey, it seems like the French are into their wine. And they want to, and we, and we, just, we, don't, we don't have it all yet. They are in the streets all over, except mm -hmm. in China. The time that each species of bee makes the same honey because yes. they go to the same yes. plants. Yes. So then their pollen is the same as well? Basically. So yes. the, the ones that make sweet pollen this, will be one variety and the ones this, that make sour this pollen the next? Yes. All right. This makes, this has no acidity, no discernible acidity at all in the pollen. This is also the answer to the peak, itaka, itaka pig one. Right? The honey is always, I've never found the honey to be anything else but crystal clear, like water. The, the Petit Angel has relatively sweet pollen. The Wano has very sour pollen. Very sour, and, and, the, and the Eric also, the two Melaponas have very sour pollen. So you can't eat a lot of it. You know, screw up your face like sucking a lamb. Okay? So you have to be very careful. And they are, they are not diligent in keeping the hive clean at all. So reboxing and harvesting, if you're not diligent and the forest fly is getting, that hive is dead. That hive is dead. The, 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 the Petit Angel and the Caca Pagon, you can be very sloppy and they're going to take care of themselves. Okay? They, they are very resistant to the, to the forest flies. Right? Um, so you have to be, yeah, the, 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 the pollen is going to take some work. But there is, you can, once it's all been picked out, you can add more honey to it and blend it. And, and um, make a, a honey pollen blend, like a, like a cream, and people buy that. Right? And I've started a little half an hour series inside there of what plants are potentially useful and plants that are local that you should put in, which will attract bees, yeah, and birds and bats and all that sort of thing. It's information that's taken straight from the literature, yeah. I don't rear any bees of my own. I'm giving you information as an academic, but there's a lot of information out there, and that's the, that's, that's the key thing. Give me the first slide there. Yeah. Our key should work. We can skip this one. Um, well, save it. You guys were here when Dr. Star gave spoke about bees and their background and who they're related, related to. Mm -hmm. So when you check in the literature, you see the reference Meloponini. Meloponini just means stingless bees. And of course, we have other bees that we know of, of which Apis is just one. Uh, next slide. We dwell too much in it because we have limited time. Those of you who weren't here on the first day, so Star would have given you a list minus the, the species names. These are the species names again from Star and Book. That publication is available online. Yeah. Of course. So things have changed. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Tribal so, and Negros now. Exactly. So these have changed. Yeah. They'll have changed. Yeah. But the general, general and number as far as we know, and of course new ones will get added to that. Hopefully when we do our survey. Right? So this is just a listen. This is the one that David was talking about that you know you probably may not want to entertain. Go on to why these for it. Right, for the daily survival. I've highlighted the three on top. I mean, they collect many things, but of course we know nectar. And that really is as a food resource for them, right? For energy mm -hmm. requirements. Of course, which they will then store as well. Pollen for protein and other nutritional needs. Because insects do need um, protein. Resins and other plant materials for nest building. And those are the three ones for plant products. Of course, they also collect water for cooling the hives and for metabolic processes. Uh, soil and sand, because some of them do use it to build their nest. Right? Mm -hmm. oh, all this. I don't know if Halatoma is one of those that yeah. probably integrates yeah, that the that's why it's called Yeah. And of course, twigs and plant material as well. All that gets incorporated into these nice trucks. So those are the main things that these would collect when they go out and forage. Right? Next one. So what exactly 
that is a resin. That's a textbook definition there, solid or semi-solid, amorphous material, doesn't really have any shape. Yeah? Uh, comprising a complex blend of organic compounds, go to Okay. It's soluble in water, but of course soluble in certain organic solvents. Yeah. The plant usually pushes these out from specific organs or tissues. It's not to say that if you damage the plant, it will not come out. And that's one of the main distinctions between resin and sap. Sap is sugary. Push the next one. Sap is sugary and watery. Yeah, mainly transported within the vascular bundle, the xylem and fluid tissues. So don't confuse resin and sap. Two different things. And of course, sap not to be confused with latex. Yeah. Um, we'll touch back on this when we start to look at the different plants and the plant families, and you notice some trends, uh, which will become obvious after a while, eh? because certain plants produce milky sap. Yeah. Certain plants mm. have clear sap. Certain plants will have the resin, certain plants will have latex. Yeah, everybody knows about tapping rubber trees and so forth, right? Good. So if you're, when you're tapping the rubber tree, you're not killing the plant. So obviously, that latex has to be coming from somewhere different than the plant sap. If you were taking out the plant sap, the plant would eventually die. Which incidentally is what people try to do when they ring a tree to kill it. Mm -hmm. so? Good. Yeah. And usually you see a bulge developing on both sides. Yeah, as the mm -hmm. tree tries to find a way around it. Okay, so that's just the plan, sir. Going quickly. Alright, so I mentioned before that same text I showed you on pot honey has um, a section, a chapter, where they basically review the information from the literature. Yeah? Um, together with data collected from Africa at the time. So it's really a, a review of plants used in Africa, but also for the general literature for the tropics and neotropics and so forth. Right? I've only put about three or four of these up. Again, you can check the reference yourself. Yeah. But what stands out when you look at that list is the wide range of plants that stingless bees visit. Yeah. Of course, the authors focused on Meliconola, which we don't have, Melifona, Trigona, and of course, Apis is inside of there, yeah? just for comparative purposes. And you quickly recognize that, so let's look at Apis. This mm -hmm. is just the, the first set from A to I think. These are your Apis, these are your Melipona. Who's collecting nectar, who's collecting pollen? Mm -hmm. yeah? Some of those plants would be from the <coughs> This is your mango, Abyssinia. Yeah? Well, we don't, I don't think anybody grows any um, onion and that sort of thing. People grow onion here? Probably. Uh, Anacardium. That's the cashew. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Start to go down, you see some others. Mango, <coughs> and, <coughs> mango and hog plum and so forth. Tapira, good. Next slide. Bactris is even on that list. Yeah. This continues. Quite extensive. Camelina. Camelina, that's what you call water grass. Yeah, of course we have Camelina elegant here. But you take one like Camelina, for instance, and you go, of course, these are the little blue flowers that you see popping up. Spider one. Good, all the time. Oh, spider Yeah, let's go across that. And do you realize? No, no. Correct. Uh, Camelina. Have I lost Camelina? Climber. Good. Nectar. And pollen. But notice for ones like that, no stingless bee. Huh. Yeah, well, interesting. <coughs> Again, based on the literature. Now this is where you have a little bit of conflict. Because I have literature from Costa Rica that shows stingless bees in the gym from the animal guns. Hmm. So what am I getting at you here? It's variable, it's wide. And in most instances, they simply look at um, their visitation. When they're trying to elucidate whether or not they've collected pollen, that's because now they've gone into the hives and they've taken it out and they've analyzed the pollen. Yes. Yeah. They've done pollen studies. That's how they work back to so you know what plant they're based on and collected from. But that's not to say that you can't see a single tree that's going to visit a particular plant. It may simply be there to collect nectar or pollen. But unless it's actually been studied and documented, you cannot see it. Right? So what we can infer, we can infer that it's there to collect something. Yeah. Move to the next. 
So it is documented, you got about four or five pages of this for you. This is an address one. Various idea. Guy knows various idea, right? Various idea. Oh, glory see that. I think bastardized name call it. Glory see that. Quick stick. Quick stick. Right? You can see the old estates and so forth. Right there. Is that one there? They have a fancy yeah. back right behind, if you look I'll above, above the... Aha, right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right there. Nice, oh, pink flower. Yeah. Very showy, very nice. Yeah. Coach Olera is on this list. Because it's not only the bigger plants. This is a shrub. A people call Shak Shak. Yeah, nice yellow, nice yellow flowers. Yellow and pink. When it starts to dry, shake it, rattle and make a noise. Yeah, bees love it. Good. Who else is on the list you might recognize? Do, do, cotton. We have cotton here. Ricinus, well, nice castor, castor, castor plant. Well, we have castor here, castor here. We have several castors in here. Mm-hmm. Shane, can I check for something? When back to the list, you said you should have been right. Mm-hmm. And um, is, is your table showing the you know what you origin on that? Go back. Where, where did you do that? Very soon. Oh, that's where I was. Three Melipona mm-hmm. is on it. No it is. No it is. Mm-hmm. Of course, um, that's why I put it to text because they've given you the references so you can easily check mm-hmm. to see what literature. Yeah. Of course this was current at the time. I think this was twenty twenty six. No, twenty thirteen. Twenty thirteen. Yeah, so that's what. Nine years, years ago. Ten, almost ten years ago. Lyricity is a big part of ages. Yeah. Yeah. But it's interesting that they didn't pick up ages. Right. So, again. Okay. Alright, next one. Maybe have one more. Who we have inside here? Utility? Oh, that's a farm. Da da da. Agave. Hmm. Bactrius. Grasses inside there. Might be in here. But we're gonna. Uh-huh. None of what you all might recognize. Jacaranda, even though we have a different species. Next one, I think that's the last one. I think I put more than. Ooh, I put more inside it. Wow. I already gave you all a lot. Aldesia. Right. Mimosa is here. Mimosa is one of those that I've been recommending a lot as the sort of thing that you can plant, which will be seasonal. So even when the trees aren't flowering, these are still going to it. And you see them going to it. You see things like these as well. So a lot of times we focus a lot on the bigger trees and people are trying now because the bees will forage based on the bigger trees. Mm-hmm. But you do have a lot of understory plants and mm-hmm. roadside shrubs and herbs that are flowering almost year round. But those are the ones that we tend to take out. Therein lies the problem because that's a natural source of food for a number of bees, including singer bees. Mm-hmm. What am I getting at here? You don't want to take out those nice roadside herbs. Yeah? Mm-hmm. And all this sort of stuff that might be invasive. Even though a number of them, you know, you can do it out, but in the same breath, they are potentially good source of food. So just to share a story from what exactly what you're saying, mm-hmm. um, I had a beekeeper who had recently started, have this nice big estate and everything. And this is what we commonly call white dove. You mm-hmm. would have it growing in this driveway and all of those guys cutting it down. Yeah. Until you go early in the morning and realize everything was covered with apis because they were actually feeding on that pollen early in the morning, not during the day. So that also points out something, it's observation that led exactly. into that. Exactly. Yeah. So while we may have stuff in the literature, people always ask me, what should I plant, what should I plant? Your eyes and your senses won't fool you. So if you're going out and you have an area that you're looking to plant stuff in, or the eyes here set up this thing that's this, and you just look early morning, late afternoon, you will see. And if you've seen something that they're going to, you keep it. Simple as that. Is. Not mm-hmm. rocket science here. There's a lot of literature that will probably tell you which ones are more beneficial than others. And that's what we'll come to in a bit. Ones that can give you less in more so than the others. But in general, a lot of flowers, a lot of the weedy stuff you see around, a lot of the local native ones are that too, because we have a lot of exotics. These visit. Yeah? And you see that when you start to go through the literature. Yes. Melia Cedaraptor is me. Which one is that? That means that it's bringing a bell. Melia and Cedaraptor. Ah. What does it mean, boy? That's Cedaraptor. I've lost it in my mind now, you know. Oh, yeah. 
Again, all depends on who you go out with. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Goes for the extra floral nectar as well. Mm -hmm. But I would speculate that stingless bees also visit that extra floral nectar mm -hmm. as well as the nectar. Yeah? But of course, this is potentially a resin plant, is it? Mm -hmm. Not a resin plant. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. That producing latex. And mm -hmm. that latex is taken up by um, Tagon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not, I'm not sure if Fatamola takes up latex, but um, Tagon takes up latex. Right, next one. Secopia. Yeah, what people call guacano. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Quite common all over the place, easy enough to grow. Um, huh? You have one outside there too, yeah? I'm sure there's lots of them. It's this right there. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that should be an exotic. Um, yeah, it's not an exotic. That's a typo. They will go to the um, they will, I think they will take from um, insects eating on it, on it. They also they can pollen also. Well, you have two things happening here. Yeah. So you have, you have the flowers. I didn't put any flowers up. That was the only quote I could get. But you do have an association of this with many ants. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because you have to live on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the ants take care especially. Um, but those ants aren't collecting honey, do they? Yeah. That's the only thing. And I doubt that they're actually secreting anything else. So it's most likely just the flowers um, that they come in the, the guacano does make a high protein pellet. Yeah. If you look at the base where mm -hmm. the leaf meets the stem, mm -hmm. they have little white, oh. tiny little white things. And what we call little pearl bodies. Yeah, oh. they, um, I think the ants um, harvest that, but also secure, secure feed, feed on them. Yeah, you're quite right. In fact, that's the reason why Secopia has an association with Azteca and they provide two things. I didn't want to go into that, but the, the nature of the of the trunk, they can actually hollow out and use as a nest, mm -hmm. and then the, the plant itself is providing a food resource. Mm -hmm. You don't want to go too far there because mm -hmm. if we go down a different road as yeah. to why the plant is doing that and why ants and so forth. But just appreciate that it's the plant's way of defending itself, and they've evolved and they realize that, you know what, I give them some food, just like if I give them nectar, they'll come and pollinate mm -hmm. a flower. If I give the ants some food, they'll come. And ants, by their mere presence, are very good defenders of any plant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Some give uh, actual protein reward, starch and so forth. Some will give sugar in the form of extra floral nectar. Because extra floral nectar is nectar not associated with the flower. It's coming out from some other plant parts. Mm -hmm. good. And then some will actually offer a house, a home, to build a nest and accommodate the plant. Yeah. In the literature, you'll see the classic example of acacia and pseudo mix. One's acacia from Africa and mm -hmm. Australia. So. But we're not going on that road. Even mm -hmm. though that's very interesting, and we should probably have a workshop mm -hmm. on it. Uh, next one. Multaceae. So, lumped all three together your clove, your pimento, um, bay leaf, bay tree, bay tree. Again, that whole family that's known for its oils and its fragrances. So I imagine um, they had to be some Kajuka, you put Kajuka inside here. Yeah. 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 That's, that's your wild, 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 wild nutmeg. Your wild nutmeg. Pirola. Pirola when you're going to all up on the east-west. Yeah. Or you go to Savannah. No, no, you go to Savannah. Are you poor? You get it all over the forest. Or you get it right going or you are in the forest. Yeah, you get it all over the forest. It's all over But what is the family characteristic of strong smelling oils and so forth? Yeah, strong scents. Abundance of flowers. Abundance of flowers. Right. One of our resin plants. Yeah. No. Based on your experience. Um, I don't know how much resin it produces. It, it does produce a lot of sap. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that it's, I, I, I have this sap from it for medicinal properties, but I've never got resin out of it. Yeah. What happens when when the cajuca are flowering? You get an abundance of flowers on the ground under the trees, mm -hmm. and you'll see things be on the flowers on the ground. Mm -hmm. Don't know the because I really can't see what going on yeah. 100 feet in the air, but we can't see. But if they on those flowers, they must be on those flowers. So. Yeah. Okay. All right. Next one. 
citrus, of course. And of course, this is where it's either a pest or, or beneficial um, thing. David is convinced that it's not um, really a pest, that it's something that's pouring holes into the fruit itself. Next one. All right, Naked Indian. I don't know if that term is PC these days, but we're sticking with it. Uh, also inside this family, as you can appreciate, is your incense wood. Yeah, mm -hmm. your protium. Again, very, very fragrant and so on. Naked Indian itself is, is local, as well as the um, Kotiya Pelanya. Frankincense is in this family, by the way, but we don't have any frankincense trees in here. That's the family. Sir. I have a, the, the, the guy that came here with me when I did the first workshop, not, not in the city, the first time I came here, he has a frankincense right here in Freeport. Really? And, uh, Catch, he does landscaping and he catches bees with it because of the one. The one eating it down. I wouldn't ask how he got it here. Yeah, also. Supposed to, eh? Supposed to. Alright. Um, Brian. Right. Alright, and we have some others here within the Anacardi AC, so Cashew. Everyone is familiar with that. And exotic nonetheless. Next one. There were three anacardias inside it. Mango, of course. But see, um, cashew is not indigenous to this grape. No. It's not, not cashew either. Oh. Based on the literature. No, I, yeah, I just mm -hmm. know. I know. Cashew is not grape. Yeah, this should be in Trinidad today. Because you grew up knowing it here, right? Yeah. 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 yeah, we don't know why. But it is from yeah. Central America. Yeah. It can be found there, yes. But it's not indigenous to Central America, or is it? I don't think it's indigenous to Central America. I was under the opinion it's indigenous to Central America. No, it's indigenous to the bioregion. No, no, no. No, the Cerrado. I think it's indigenous to the Cerrado. The Cerrado in Brazil. The same place that the strawberry guava comes from. The Cerrado? Yes, where the cashew comes from. Yeah. Down there, where you get the fire pass and all the time. It's such a big thing in Asia now, but it's not from Asia. And also, also what is, is um, um, I think from down there, in, um, what I know as Jamaica plum. The little red and yellow plum that's eaten mm -hmm. with pepper and salt on the green. Right, I think that, that because that, nobody, nobody thinks of those seeds growing. It needs fire to grow. Okay. So what he's talking about is this, this, this genus, Spondius, of which hot plum is just one inside. Yeah. So, all of the other things that you probably think in a local, and I realize that's a big thing. So all your um, governor plum, and your poxy tea, and so on, all that is spondius, but not native. Mm. Well, you, not you, native. Call, you call it governor plum, right? plum. I yeah. know governor plum is the one you roll with the seeds. Like series. Yeah, series. Series. Not series. <laughs> You're sure? Yes, yeah, series. series is phylanthus. That's why you are series. No. So you see, all right, so you see. Uh, I like it. No, I like it. No, 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 no
Oh, also like a series. Like a little pumpkin. Yeah, yeah like, like a, a series. Yeah, yeah. No, no, we that's because like, of the goose smell. But that's for that, just acid. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. More, more closely related to the seed on the leaf. Seed on the leaf, that's the same way there. That's, that's a phalanx as well. Yeah. But you see how just the common names could, could throw us totally off, eh? Because mm -hmm. I would, in going up in Tobago, that was not no Governor Plum. Governor Plum is something totally different. Yeah, because that's the Tobago name. It named the Tobago name, they tried to So that too. Mm -hmm. and, and what has happened also is that the old people have not passed the knowledge to the younger generation. Mm -hmm. So the younger generation say something and use it in incorrect. Yeah. Like I, I was having a discussion with people that the younger generation of people that keep birds, right? Mm. They don't know the old for terms in the aviculture, the old aviculture. If for them, a sem is a green female sem. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. The male is a vemal, the black and yellow is uh -huh. the vemal. Vemal means old male. Yeah. So any male bird that has molted out into the yeah, adult yeah, yeah. So a black and red bullfinch is a yes, vemal. Yeah. You have your you have your sem, you have your shant sem, you have your vemal, you have your taude. All of these and the younger generations never picked up so those old pack on names and which is then why scientists stick to the Scientific yes. Go back to that. Yeah. But I want to point out here, so spongius is quite bombing, hop plum is native to here. But all the other spongius we have are not. The dulcis, like I said, the pom the pom city, sorry. Um, and the other things are not. So bees bees will go to this. Next one. Mm -hmm. David, you had this in your list and it just yep. turned up in the literature. Yep. Um, as one of the resin trees. It should be obvious to anybody that this is not native yeah. to here, right? Any of them. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but you have people who have it in their yard, yeah. you know, a nice little thing with like little Christmas tree and so forth. But of course, this family <laughs> together really? with the yeah. pine is yeah. where most of the pines oh. come into play. Interesting enough, Chevacarpus is not um, this today, right? but uh, so again, and a good source of resin, as, as you would expect. All right. Um, these that are coming up <coughs> are the ones from the literature I told you about from Costa Rica, where they basically looked at uh, plants that were growing in urban and suburban areas and on degraded land, and land that eventually became degraded. Yeah, So they were tracking both bees and stingless bees to see who was visiting. They didn't look at any pollen studies. But it shouldn't surprise you that stingless bees are attracted to what we call bargy here. Yeah. At least one of the bargy, because they have plenty type of bargy, right? Yeah. But Amaranthus pineus, which is native. Yeah, that's a good sign. Next one. Coconut. And David, you had this on your list as well. Mm -hmm. Bees mm -hmm. love coconut. They're always around palm coconut. Tree. Any palm. Any palm. They love it. They love it. Um, but of course, coconut, I know, we're thinking Caribbean, we're thinking West Indies and tropical, but it's not native to this part of the world. I know, that's shocking people. But textbook wise, it's not. But for intents and purposes, it's been naturalized, right? So, feel free to plant it. Next one. Mm. You guys saw this on your on your on your way in. Yeah. If you're observant, it's right there, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Cosmos. The shape right. most most palms would be attractive to. Yes. Palms any, in any kind of palm. Yeah. Any kind yeah. doesn't have to be a coconut. Doesn't have to be a coconut. Any kind. Yeah. I put coconut and, there and because coconut at least has some other use for us. I mean, the other plants will, but people can appreciate planting a coconut and getting some nuts to eat and. Water to drink. They may not appreciate planting Bactris. Yeah, what about Rosso? They wouldn't want to do Bactris. But Bactris is a good defensive barrier. This is small time with the Pushkin Tone Stick. Exactly. Good for sex. Or Gugu and Gugu. Good for sex. Good for sex. So, Cosmos. Go back to the Cosmos. Um, this is the exotic one. We have one native one, which you can tell from the color. Call that one. Yeah, it has here. For me, it's always tricky. I could only really tell them when they start to flower. Because when they're all green, all the leaves are generally the same. I mean, there are differences. I think the color has it, it, I have seen variations. It's, yeah. it's variable. It all depends on where it's growing. If you put it in healthy soil, exactly. plenty of fertilizer, looking yeah. healthy, of course. But the flowers are usually a dead giveaway. Yeah. And you have others within the same genus. Right? The cosmos is a nice one if you get the local one. Next one. You guys have seen this all over the place. Mm -hmm. it's yeah, it is an exotic, but it's so ubiquitous. Um, and this flowers the year round. Mm -hmm. No, 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 no. You probably cut it when you're cutting your lawn and so forth. But an ideal thing to keep. 
you come out in the mornings and look, you'll see plenty deeps there, stingless geese as well. Yes. Yeah. Next one. Just a couple more. You know, we tight for time. Ah, check over. Everybody's seen this around. Yeah. We go to the Eagle Pui. Nice and yellow. The Pui bush. Yeah, of course, like to put up gardens and use it as a kind of little. I see um, some business spaces put it out front. Yeah, flowers nice and so forth. When it's in full bloom, very nice. Yeah. Again? Is this nectar and pollen? Or? From the literature, as far as we know, nectar and pollen, yes. Coma stand. Interesting one that turned up from the literature. Um, not as common, but definitely native. See a lot of it in Tobago. Belly A plant. Mm -hmm. Some of you guys may know it. Medicinal. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. So when I make recommendations on these plants, I'm trying to put in things that also have a little balance inside it. So this has medicinal value for those who know how to use it. Mm -hmm. So if you were to think what you should I put in, have plenty of local stuff. Just about to say as you say that. But this one may have additional medicinal value. So you can in two birds at one stone. Yeah? And it's always good to have medicinal plants around. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Always good. So Drachofa is very good. Not to be confused with there's another Drachofa. It's the real physical. The green leaves. The leaves are green. And more rounded. Yeah, more rounded. And you see those with the, the red flowers coming on top. But that one is nasty to play with. I think that's Drachofa. Uh, is it true physical? They have, they have a couple of jokes. It's, it's um, escaping me. But some people call it a ginseng plant because it kind of bulbous at the, at the base. No, that's a different one. Yeah, I'm sorry, I don't have a photo. We have the real physic nut here. The leaf wants to look like the big leaf chaya. You know, the two chaya, right? It wants to look like a lot of people mistake the real drug for. for. This is this is Pinon Rojo and then Pinon Blanca is the white one. The white one. Right? This is the uh, like the flowers are right. Sorry, you said the flowers are right. Um, the larger one, um, yes, it does not have red flowers. That they have, they have that up, up by me yet, but it's not as um, it's not as common as this one because it's medicinal, but it is um, it's more toxic. Mm -hmm. So you 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 wait if you don't know what you're doing. You know you know Trinidadians, every bush is well, everything. The other the other yes. one that I have in mind, I don't know why it's escaping me. But you really have to know when you're picking it and what part you're picking. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Because you know, the side effects are not the best. That's why it's called the second one. Then dry it's one. Alright, next one. This is the last one. So it's Kalyandra. You guys see in so long for you. Um top of that one. These are our native species. And I just put this here more for information purposes. Because in an ideal scenario, somebody goes out in the bush, they ain't going to tell the difference between the two. Yeah? But this is the one you see around a lot. The hematosophila, but this is exotic. Yeah? All right. What? I have more? All right. Mm -hmm. The residia. I think we touched on this before. Quick stick. Very nice when it's in bloom. Lots of bees like it. Lots of ants go it, by the way. That's not something for you guys to consider. And I think it also has medicinal purposes for those who know how to use it. That's you know how to use the roots. Alright, next one. Ah, here's a nice one. Sweet boom. Now there are many things people call sweet boom. Which is one of. But this one is called Paria dulcis, which is, which is a native version. Very small plant. You could almost mm -hmm. miss it when you're when you're cutting. But again from the literature, bees sing that bees like the flowers, like to go pick for nectar. And this will bloom basically year round. Yeah. You have any more? Ah. A favorite of mine, although it's an exotic, and in some countries it can be considered an invasive because when this gets in, it just just spreads. Yeah. But this flower is year round. Mm -hmm. uh, if I had to recommend something that was exotic that I could live with, that I think is nice to look at and also beneficial, this would be it. Yeah. It also bears a root, right? If you cut it down, it will always grow back. It bears a root, not very big, right? That resembles a cassava. That's how it's like a little rhizome, almost. Like, um, more like that won't grow back. Or well, more like a small mini root. It's like a cassava. Yeah, it's like a cassava. If you cut that off and plant it, it won't grow back. It, it has to be the, the head of what you cut off. Yeah. But that is that is just like a cassava, the storing food supplies, so. Yeah. You know, but 
you can eat it. Yeah. So this is pretty hardy, you know, you'll see in dry season. That is the same, same, same family as um, uh, buckwheat. Same, same family as buckwheat. Well, this is also the same family as your cocoa lover. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Fat hook. No, no. Fat hook is not No, no, no. Fat hook is quite a balance. Huh? No, cocoa lover is your... Ah, uh, the big leaf in the forest. The tree and, and like you have sea grape. The balum. Sea grape. Yeah. Balum, yeah, forest grape. Forest balum. The forest grape. Yeah. yeah. That's most balum. Of, and then you have sea yeah. grape as well. Big, big. No, no, no. Well, I don't know. Maybe it's a different thing. No, balum. As you want to go straight in a stool with some big, big leaves. Yeah. Big round leaves. Yeah. yeah. And it bears a bunch like sea grape. Yes. Yeah. yeah. yeah but sea grape is also in this family. Okay. Probably going to eat it. But that's cocoa lover unifera. Cocoa lover major is the one you see in the big forest. Because yeah, I know, I know, I know. Say the color, but not the shape of the flower. Would it be visited by coming with something? Yes, I didn't. I should have said something about that before. So we began to generalize huh, in terms of color and shape. Usually, it's a good guide of what will come to the flower. All right. If you see something that is tubular, like a little trumpet, chances are mm -hmm. something that needs a beak or has a proboscis to go down inside it, what's going to go there. But if it's wide enough, a bee or an insect will slip in as well, right? It's like um, the other factor to consider is when they bloom. So we distinguish day blooming from night blooming. Cactus open in the night, some of them like your dragon fruit, right? So you'll tell yourself only bees, or sorry, not bees, only um, bats would right. visit it. But the insects are flowering in the night, and you have much that come out as well. Mm -hmm. So they are also potential pollinators. So much like this, even though insects are most likely visited because of how small it is, and insects that can fall in as well, it's not to say that a bird or something more opportunistic will come to it. But of course, a bird wouldn't get the volumes of nectar that you really want. I mean, birds will hardly come to this. They would have to go to a whole set of flowers to get any nectar that would be any value. I mean, they're constantly exerting a lot of energy. But as I often say, the best thing is just observation. Yeah. Yeah. What I will add to this is if any of you all intend to plant this for bees, you're going to have to buy a lot, a lot, a lot of bachak leaves. I have been unable to get this to grow by me and Kumako. Bachaks love this. They love, love, love this. I have used tons of bachak leaves and still have to grow. Bachaks are tricky ones, and I. I I can suggest a strategy which I think could work. Um, I don't like to encourage killing of batch mm -hmm. yeah, Some potent stuff that, you know, take it back in this and disseminate the whole nest. But again, I think careful observation. You can probably offer a sacrificial plant, what I call a sacrificial plant. Something that they prefer to go to. Um, I just off the record, uh, there is a school of thought that the batch are part of the system. Eh? Mm -hmm. And if you see them going after plants, um, consider that they're like pruning, you know, like when you call in a local gardener, because they are plants that they will pass whole night and not attack them at all. Now I know this is a bit out there, but the whole point is that they're really serving a function to the plant that we're not aware of. Yeah? By having to defoliate it. Now you might want to consider maybe some of the stuff we're introducing here. It's so exotic for them that they'd rather take it out. So I can I can I can see a batch going after this. I know it's a bit out there in terms of that thinking, but remember we're part of a bigger environment. But yeah, yeah. it may also be so I, I kind of believe in that same train of thought and I've been talking to people in Brazil where they're trying to manage batak. Mm -hmm. Um and what they've figured out is that batak are normally go into a system that needs pruning so that whenever they see batak attacking a certain area they prune the whole area. And then the bacha leaves and go elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. but what what happens is sometimes these vines are more pioneer species, and if they're growing in an old growth area, mm -hmm. then the bacha will try and take these out because the rest of these stuff is old growth. Mm -hmm. And if you have this in a certain area where there's old growth, then they're actually synchronizing mm -hmm. stuff that's all old growth and anything that's new growth they take out. So, but if you plant everything new growth, then sometimes they will leave it alone. But it's, it's, a, it's a new science that people are yeah. talking around. Yeah. And, and then that's why it's a bit out of the way, because yeah. the batch acts are really having to restore a balance, you know. But of course, for us to appreciate that is for us to think a little different than we're normally used to. Now, let me put it in my two cents and let me tell you what I think is going on. I think people might be giving batch a lot more 
credence and it is you. You will find that plants, when they are attacked, will produce toxins. And it is known that uh, you will see a backpack feeding on something and then they stop and they switch. And if you look at them in the night, it starts to put a completely different leaf. So let us, let us say that you have an orange field and they, they, they cut in orange. But all of a sudden they stop. And all of a lot of other orange trees around, they will start cutting something else. I think what might be happening, I mean, we all shooting in the dark, but I think what is happening is they feed on a plant and they change for two reasons. They're changing the nutrition base for their fungus, so that the fungus is not being fed on one thing all the time, right? And secondly, the plant has started to produce toxins, whether it's tannins or some other antifungal that will kill their fungus garden, and they switch to a new plant. These are all plants that might have grown up in the same environment as leaf cutter ants, so they have adapted to the leaf cutter ants. This is introduced, mm -hmm. so this might be what another thing that I have tried to grow inside of Kumak that I cannot get to grow at all is Chinese yam. The air potato, you know the yam that it bears mm -hmm. yam on the vine that you have to get? Can yeah. I get that to grow, partner? And how all other kind of yam growing? I mean, not that. Which one is alluding to because it's an exotic? Yeah. And so they don't That's have the toxins yeah. to recognize that the ant is cutting them to start to produce the toxins. Right, like uh, 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 they have occasions in Africa that from the time the, the gazelles start raising on them, they start to produce um, tannins. Mm -hmm. And it, it drifts in the breeze that the acacias in the surrounding area start to elevate the level of, of tannins. Yeah. And the, the, especially the acacias in the real arid regions, and the gazelles move on. So it might be that these just don't have any chemicals to knock back the batch out. So they just feed on it, feed on it until. So what's David, your David, with yeah. the air potato though, I can only grow it in one place on this farm, by that a motel tree. Everywhere else I move it, the bachar take it. But what plant is this? The air potato, the same right, yeah. the Chinese yam. Yeah. And it grows by what tree? It's grown by the motel tree there, and every year it grows up, and it makes a few, and it drops them, and I take those, and I put them everywhere else, and the bachar flick them up. But for some reason, they grow over there. So the I bachar, just leave it to grow over there. And the bachar doesn't attack anything else there as well? It, it doesn't bachar. bother with stuff over there for some reason. All right, you know, you know what you can try <laughs> to grow it on, that I know that bachar can't, can't take? Five fingers. Hmm. So maybe the five fingers. They love the five fingers. Yeah, they will one feed only five fingers, and the next one you see dead backtrack everywhere. Yeah. So we have lots of gaps in our knowledge. Yeah, we know this. And, <laughs> yeah. and that being said, there's plenty of literature on backtrack. Yeah. After several and the others have been well studied. Well studied. Well studied. Because well well so they're very advanced and they're doing interesting stuff. So the only answer mm -hmm. we know that ten years. Yeah. 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 Does it produce a sap? Because an indigenous Guyanese guy told me at time when I told him I had a problem with black He said it was one or two things. He was looking for the local chemicals. He said, Can I use this chemical to get out dead and everything? Or you can plant sweet potato where the leaves sap. So you got the sap. When they come to eat at it, the um they call those mandible. Mandible. Right. Will get it's a general rule of thumb. That's why some families are less prone to attack. Mm -hmm. So you're more AC and you for the AC and so forth. Like the cogents. Bachak's highly over cogents. Even though they could. Even though they could. Our bachak only takes. If we have a bachak, it will need. But they only take half of it every year. Yeah. They part of it every year. They part that's in the shade, they take, and they part that's in the sun, they leave. They only take half of it every year. They part that's in the shade, they take, and they part that's in the sun, they leave. They're technically toxic. You call the AC family toxic. The whole plant has gone overnight and then. So you wouldn't see them going after um, any plant that has thick latex, your balata tree and all this sort of thing. That's not the game. So, but that's not to say that the whole plant will have the same extent of latex being produced at the same point in time. Um, I don't want to get too much into it, but just appreciate that plants that are more vulnerable, which tend to have more, because the plant is really trying to protect those, just like with the resins and the gums and so on, yeah, as opposed to older plants. If I have a batch, I can go after an older leaf that's on its way out, which has less of the white sticky sap. Mm -hmm. yeah. Alright, next one. I think this is the last one. No time is tight. No? Did I touch this? Yeah. Cap Capraria. Um, good old GTF. Again, medicinal with the eyes and stuff like this, you know, wash it and so on. Um, kind of hard to come by these days. Hey, what? Yeah. Because. I mean, if you want. Today I could find, but. 
I give you quite a lot of people weed and cut and hack and so forth. Exactly. Because a lot of times you're not leaving it to see the flower. Yeah. But it has a very nice white flower that stingless bees have been observed at. And again, high medicinal value. Yeah. Alright, I think that's the last one. Yes, that is the last one. Good thing. Any quick questions? Um Ipomias? Yeah, I didn't I didn't put any any, any of the Ipomias in. I, I probably should have. Uh, yeah, because that's native to the new world, if I'm right. You have several native here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't put in any um, any of the cucumber TAC for you and the vines and stuff. Um I'm gonna leave something for you to come to the webinars. We have more stuff. Yeah. <laughs> uh, at the end of the day, we're gonna have a, a more complete publication because that's what we're putting together now. I'll just talk about that. Um, a plan for a later database. We're basically scoring the literature and putting together all the information that we can find, which will include this all information into one one location. Yeah, so that nice. people can easily um, find it. So you don't have to do the research yourself. Of really? course, it will only be current as of this year, and then. We need to put something in place so that it can be updated as we go along, so things are continually changing. Mm -hmm. right. Any questions okay. on anything I've said? Anything not too clear? I don't know, either you or David could take this. They were going back to when David was talking about smoking out the um, bees or the smoke drops them. Mm -hmm. um, does, can, can you use mushroom, wire mushroom, as a smoker? You want to get a deep eye No, no, because it happened by total accident. I wasn't even aware there were mushrooms growing underground, to say, till yeah. I was burning some stuff outside my yard. And I rain fell, sun come up, and the ground was still smoking. So I clear off everything. Why does the ground still smoking? I would recommend mushrooms to anyone. And you will see that there is a, a local site on Facebook that people are always asking about mushrooms, and the gentleman always turning people away because. Mushrooms are a tricky, tricky, yeah. tricky, tricky yeah. to ID. Yeah. Yeah. They don't know what you're doing. The mushroom that you get in the tin, Definitely. the little white button mushroom, mm -hmm. they have a whole set that are also in that family, agaricus, mm -hmm. right? Like destroying the angel and all these things that will kill you at the blink of an eye, yeah. right? And they, they are misidentified in the States and Europe every year, and people die every year because they think that they're picking regular white button mushrooms and they're picking pantharides or one of the close relatives in the same genus and that's it they're dead. So and we have some I don't know if we have any deadly mushrooms in China, but we have some that will make you very sick. So And we have some that will make you very high. Yeah. Well that too. I'm not I'm not encouraging people next thing. <laughs> There's at least two they come that that make you very dead. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. There's like a oxen, I don't say too much um, for obvious reasons. They have certain um, mushrooms that are included in our in our narcotics act. But if it's growing there, it's fine for you to look at. If you pick it, you're now in trouble. You're not really? supposed to pick it, yeah. Oh. Right? That means you're good to go. <laughs> <laughs> so, you need mushroom to go. Oh. Any other questions? Very good. No? Good. All right. Um, um, Zabaka. Zabaka, Zabaka, Zabaka. That's an important uh, feeding tree for the Pityagia. Zabaka. They're the primary problem with the Zabaka. So, you want to have an Huh? First year Americana, yeah. I, yeah. I didn't put it on the list, sorry. Alright, that's, that's an important, important. I mentioned something. Like and then regular. all all the resin plants. Stingless bees need resin plants. Forget just plants for them to feed on. They are major consumers of resin. So the clusia, you can grow the uh, clusia, any of the clusia, you can grow in a pot, in a big pot. Right? Uh, if you, you cut a half drum, you can put the clusia in it. So you need resin plants. So any, any pines, any any of the um, like Norfolk pine, which is not a true pine, right? Um, Simbaruba, the naked Indian, um, Hymena kubaril, um, what else? Um, there's a tree down here, it's, oh, I can't remember the name of it now, um, they call it diesel tree. They grow it in Australia now, you tap it, they put a, they put a bore into the tree and they tap it, and then what happens is... No, 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 okay, sure. It's a feeding tree in the forest for booty and um, It separates into water and oil, and you can take the oil and put it straight into a diesel engine or a diesel engine on it. Right? Um, and then, if, you, if you're keeping, if you're keeping pig on, you need resin plants. Um, oh, 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 an important, an important um, pollen, pollen, um, 
nectar source for stingless bees is a cactus vine. The name the name slips me now. It is one of it's on the it's on the base of the of the cactus family tree. It has leaves. It's a vine and the other one is the um the three in, in that family. They have leaves. Two are two are trees and one is a vine. It also goes by the name of um um Barbados Hoosbury. Bears are, make a big little cover over an arbor, makes a little white flower like a rose. It's a day blooming, a day blooming cactus. You know what I'm talking about? It makes a sour berry. Can we have it here? I have a oh. go, go on, go on Google and, and, and type in, um, in, in Barbados Gooseberry. They call the, Barbados Gooseberry the um, sour cherry. They call sour cherry Barbados you know, this is in Barbados. Uh, it has, you, know, you know there's a cactus tree that bears um, um, we call it Singapore rose or Mexican rose cactus. Look at here. Yep. That's him. First here. That's that. Yeah. Barbados gooseberry. I have two small plants of that right now. I got them from a lady down south. She has it covering over a hole. Right? And the thing with the Perusquia is it also makes a good badge. It's super high in protein, 25% protein. That whole family, whether it is the Mexican rose cactus, which is a tree, or there is another one. Or something, and then there's a full of roses of vine. It's, it's actually grown as, as a badge in the more arid re regions of Brazil. Most, most likely I introduced. Yeah, right. Yeah. right. But when that is blooming, it, it, as you can see, among the flowers it's putting out, that whole thing is alive with bees. Right? And a, a good, a good, a good, just a good yardstick to work with. If something is from the tropics, stingless bees will most probably go to it, whether it is from these tropics or not. Like um, mango. Mango is not from our tropics, but stingless bees love it. Okay? Um, well, this, this thing that they can use to Rambutan. Rambutan, stingless bees love rambutan. Right? Over in Asia, where it comes from, they have. Stingless bees over there that the main pollinators of that, right? So, if it comes, if it's a if it's a real tropical tree, you know, like not like a rose. A rose is not a real tropical flower. So, you have people have rose in the garden and it's not a tropical flower. But real tropical fruit trees, you see, bees over there. But remember, when you're planting, remember resin. Don't ever forget resin. That is just as important as stingless bees. Because if you're in a place that has no resin. But you have a lot of food for stingless bees. You might get your stingless bees with the fly paper and stuff like that. Because what is on fly paper is a resin. And if they don't get resin in one spot, they're going to get resin in another spot. So you have to put in your resin trees, your food trees, and your resin trees. All right, get your resin trees. And that's that. Have been following the webinar series? Have you guys been logging online?